For many, many years, I watched a lot of television. Because it was tension relieving, I knew it wasn't goal achieving. Tension relieving or goal achieving, how are your evenings? What are your weekends? How do you spend your free time? What do you control in your life? You certainly control your spiritual beliefs, so believe strongly the way you want. You control your thoughts and attitudes which come out of your beliefs. You certainly control your goals, they're yours. Your commitments to your goals, no one controls those but you and your priorities, you control. Your role models, well, you don't always control them and your kids are really attracted and fascinated by the Britney Spears syndrome. They're attracted by celebrities, they're attracted by action and violence. Why? It's just visceral. It's like a roller coaster ride where you put your arms up. It frightens you, but you want to do it again. And so there's this role modeling going on. Unfortunately, many of their personal lives don't match their money accomplishments. Your knowledge sources, you control those. You control your memberships, who you join. You control whether you listen or talk. And the most important thing I've learned is that third one, your free time, which I call prime time. Why is it prime time? Because it's from 7 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, five nights a week. I'm tired of watching other people making money, having fun in their professions. They want us to watch so they can get ratings and earn more money. We watch them because we're unhooking from the monotony of our lives and we're hoping to somehow escape from the drudgery of regular life to live through the celebrities and reality television. It actually entertains us, but if you will, understand, I've written 15 books and every one has been written in prime time. 7 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and on Saturdays. You see, I can't write during the week. I'm earning money. I'm putting food on the table. I have to be doing in prime time what the rest of the population is not willing to do. The differentiation between success and mediocrity is what you do in prime time. Whether you read, whether you write, whether you computer network and whether you have intimacy. The other thing you can do in prime time, which is fantastic, is get off the couch and out. Get out of the house and into ethnic restaurants. Get to job fairs, computer shows, anything that will let you and your family realize the options that you have in a world so full of abundance that it's like a gingerbread world. If you'll just take your children out of the television internet world and out to where it's happening, and live it rather than watch it. You control your friendships, the educational level, and you do control your discretionary income, which we call disposable income in the United States. We call it disposable because we get any extra, we dispose of it as quickly as we can. That way we buy things that make us feel good and we go places and put it on our MasterCard. Buy now, pay never. Response to daily events, you control your response, and that's why it's so important to understand that bad news sells. The fire that burns another warms the general population and the fact they're glad they weren't the victim of the day. So people pass on bad news, it insulates them and isolates them from the tragedies that are happening to other people. Please understand, good news never sells because it's elevator music. Good news is no news at all. So the only thing you'll witness is everything that's happening that's bad, and it'll give you just a little bit of a feeling of jaded concern, unless you understand that it's been going on since the beginning of time. Make this note, my definition of spring, opportunity. Spring is not a guarantee that you're going to have a harvest, but it's an opportunity to plant one. It's not a guarantee that things are going to go well, and you will accumulate what you need, but it is an opportunity to do so. Springtime is opportunity. Now it's usually a very short season, especially where I was raised in farm country, Idaho. So here's what you must do with opportunity. Seize it quickly. Don't let it just come and go. When the window of opportunity is open to borrow a little space language, when they get ready to shoot the rockets or off into outer space, there's a window, they call it, of opportunity to go, not go, when the weather's right, and whatever. But if, if you wait a little too long, the window closes, and it takes a while for it to open back up. So this is the key. Take advantage of the spring, such a short season. 
In some places, they got those big tractors with the lights on them going around the clock in the short season of spring to make sure that the seeds are planted. Take advantage of opportunity. Take advantage of opportunity to meet someone who could be a colleague for your future career. Take advantage of the day when it arrives, because the day will soon finish. Take advantage of the year, because it will soon close. Take advantage. My experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates, how many hours a day you waste, or how many hours a week you waste? And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50 if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not going to last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient? 10 times more efficient, 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively, and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time. Not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stop really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. And that's the thing that's interesting too, is that, and like one of the, another thing I've often asked my undergraduate classes is, you know, there's this idea that, that people have, that people have a conscience. And you know what the conscience is. It's, it's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid, telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing. You don't have to listen to it, strangely enough. But you go ahead and do it anyways, and then, oh, of course, exactly what the conscience told you was going to happen inevitably happens so that you feel even stupider about it than you would if it happened by accident. Because you, you know, I knew this was going to happen, I got a warning it was going to happen, and I went and did it anyways. And the funny thing, too, is that that conscience operates within people, and we really don't understand what the hell that is. So you might say, well, what would happen if you abided by your conscience for five years or for ten years? What sort of position might you be in? What sort of family might you have? What sort of relationship might you be able to forge? And you can be bloody sure that a relationship that's forged on the basis of who you actually are is going to be a lot stronger and more welcome than one that's forged on the basis of who you aren't. Now, of course, that means that the person you're with has to deal with the full force of you in all your ability and your catastrophe, and that's a very, very difficult thing to negotiate. But if you do negotiate it, well, at least you, you have something, you have somewhere solid to stand, and you have somewhere to live, you have a real life, and it's a great basis upon which to bring children into the world, for example, because you can have an actual relationship with them instead of torturing them half to death, which is what happens in a tremendous, a tremendously large minority of cases. Well, it's more than that too, because, and this is what I'll close with, and this is why I wanted to introduce Solzhenitsyn's writings to you, you see, because it isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. 
It's the fate of everyone that you networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way, and then it'll decline rapidly. But 7 billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that 7 billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you, you'll know a thousand people at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each. And that puts you one person away from a million and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence. It's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really asked yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters. But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. You know, when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff, and I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr, so that's a pretty good deal, all things considered. Especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really. Really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what hell is like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit. Or even more importantly, if it's a, light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends. Because that's what happened in the 20th century.